Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for um, taking some time out of your day. Uh, Elsie mentioned today we are going to look at year end donor stewardship and all of the uh, exciting things that come along with that. So uh, this is the third edition of Care Labs Year End Giving Series. I'm sure you've learned a ton from um, the team so far, but today um, we're really going to look at showing your donors some love during the most important time of year for fundraising. So specifically, we're going to look at the basics of donor stewardship, uh, where you can focus your energy to see the highest return. And we're going to look at, you know, giving Tuesday activities and beyond to take your stewardship right through until January. Um, and then, as Elsie mentioned, she's going to hop on at the end and show you all of the good things that Keela can, can do to um, kind of help you accomplish all of these things. And then we'll have a bit of time for Q&A. So let's get going. Okay. So let's go back to basics for, for one second here. So what is donor stewardship? To put it in the most basic of terms, donor stewardship is relation building. It is the steps that you take to strengthen your relationship with your donors with the hopes that they will stay close to your organization and hopefully make another gift. Sounds easy, right? Well, if you've worked in fundraising for more than an hour, you know that that definition of donor stewardship doesn't even come close to describing all of the work that goes into stewarding a donor. Stewardship is taking donors out for coffee. It's endless amounts of phone calls and emails. It's stewardship events and dinners. It's sending gifts, impact sharing, putting together newsletters, and it is lots and lots and lots of talking. So, Today, we're going to focus, you know, on all of these things that you can do to generate the highest ROI so that you have more time to connect with those donors and make those important connections. So with all of those kind of 10,000 things going on at the same time, you're probably on this webinar because you're asking yourself, where should I focus my energy during year end? Um, well, you've come to the right place. Um, we all know this, but year-end giving season really kind of kicks off with Giving Tuesday. I'm not here to scare you or stress you out, but Giving Tuesday is exactly a week away. It is next Tuesday, so um, this is very good timing for you all to be here. If you haven't started planning your stewardship, that's okay. Um, you're in the right place. I'm not going to dive too deep into your campaign, your emails, um, that kind of stuff, because you came here to hear about search specifically. So it goes without saying that those campaign activities will be happening in tandem uh, with your stewardship efforts. But a great place to start with Giving Tuesday is understanding what your goal will accomplish. So I'm talking about, you know, the impact that the revenue that you bring in between Giving Tuesday and December 31st will have on the community that you serve. Chances are you, you probably know exactly how much you need to raise uh, to reach your target and tying an impact statement to that amount is the key to what you should be sharing with your donors during this time. It provides a tangible thing that they can see um, that they're giving money towards and they fully understand what their money is going towards. I'm sure many of you have been doing stewardship throughout the year and, and not leaving it to the end, but regardless of what you've been doing throughout the year, Giving Tuesday will set the tone for the rest of your year-end stewardship campaign. And it's really important to be properly stewarding your donors at that time. But how do you stand out? Your donors are probably getting tons of emails. They're seeing things all over social media from other organizations. We tend to inundate people with our Giving Tuesday campaigns. And that's why making it a priority to connect with as many donors as possible over the phone on Giving Tuesday is a great idea. Um, but as I mentioned, there's a million things happening at the same time. You've got your campaign emails going out. You've got your social media plans being executed. People are calling in to make donations. So how do you find the time? The first thing I would suggest is leaning on your team. And I mean your, your larger team. Um, your fundraising team is probably pretty lean. I've worked on a lot of fundraising teams where there was maybe two of us or three of us. Uh, we've all been there trying to do more with less. So giving Tuesday stewardship should really be a team effort. So start with hosting a call-a-thon. So Ask your colleagues to maybe give up their lunch break for the day and help you make calls on Giving Tuesday. 
Many of you are probably in hybrid work models um, or remote work models, uh, and calls are something that can be done from anywhere. But providing a little incentive for them to come into the office, if that's an option for you, uh, never hurts. I'm not encouraging bribery, but I have <laughs> never been disappointed with the turnout when I've offered a free lunch for something. So encourage your colleagues to come in that day. You can order a pizza, make it a team effort. It makes it a little bit more fun. And if you get you know, 10 people making consistent calls over the course of an hour, you would be surprised with how many calls that you make. Uh, but a call-a-thon also doesn't have to stop with your colleagues. So try putting a call out to your volunteers. I know when we think of volunteers, a lot of the time we only engage them when it comes to events, but you may be surprised how many people are interested in supporting you in other capacities, especially during the holiday season. It's a time when people are a little bit more generous with their time. So phone calls are accessible for a lot of people and it's a great opportunity to keep your volunteers engaged and also stewarded. Um, Tapping into your team doesn't just mean your team, your, you know, your colleagues, it means your leadership team too. Giving Tuesday is a great opportunity to give some extra love to your highest potential prospects. And by segmenting out those donors and giving your executive and leadership teams a short list to call, it provides that extra personal touch and makes your donors feel really valued. And finally, the secret to getting anyone to help you is to make it as easy as possible for them. So this includes writing scripts for them, including, you know, what to say if they're leaving a voicemail, um, give them lists with past donation amounts so they can personalize the call and basically just giving them everything that they need to be able to sit down and start making calls for you right away. Oh, my screen just froze. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Let's try refreshing this here. No worries. It happens to the best of us. I'm glad it's oh. not just me who has technical difficulties. Here we go. Beautiful. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Uh, okay, so you hosted a Giving Tuesday Callathon. You called as many donors as you could. Great job. Now, Giving Tuesday is over. It's time to keep kind of riding that wave through the holiday season and into year end. So I know we tend to kind of amp everything up towards Giving Tuesday and then we crash. Now is not the time to crash. I promise that time will come. But after Giving Tuesday, you have a huge opportunity to steward new donors. Giving Tuesday is actually one of the few days of the year that people are proactively seeking out organizations to give to rather than waiting to be asked. So that means that Giving Tuesday is one of the highest new donor acquisition days. So while you were making all of those phone calls to your existing donors, um, there's a whole bunch of people that found you for the first time and are now part of your database. This is the best time to start stewarding those donors and growing their support. So start by segmenting them out and creating another call list. These are great calls for your actual fundraising team to make to start building those relationships. And the purpose of these calls should look a little bit different. These donors are new to you. They have just given a gift for the first time. They may not be the best prospects to be asking again for your year-end campaign, but they could turn into lifelong supporters. So the purpose of these calls is true stewardship and information collecting. Call them, thank them for their Giving Tuesday gift, and ask them questions about why they chose to give to you. Uh, it's a great opportunity to discover new donors that have a close connection to your cause and that are prime candidates for other fundraising programs that you have coming up in the next year. So making that call reasonably quickly after they give their first gift to you is really important. It contributes to the first impression that they have of your organization, and it adds that personal touch that could help you stand out from all of those other nonprofits. So once you've gathered that information from them, this list will be really valuable to you in the new year when you're maybe running a recurring giving campaign that these people could be pulled into, or if you're trying to build up your major gifts pipeline. 
The next thing I would say is to lean into holiday traditions. Um, I know <laughs> we all like to think that donors make gifts from the goodness of their hearts, and there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of the time that is the case, but a little extra something never hurts. Um, and end of year giving happens to be a time where everyone is being inundated with gift giving content. Stores are talking about giving gifts. Everywhere is telling us that we need to be giving gifts, and a lot of your donors are probably stressing out about buying gifts for their loved ones. So it's a great time to give them a gift. It doesn't have to be fancy, um, but it's a good time to think outside the box in terms of, you know, think of things other than your usual branded promo items that you may be giving away at events or using throughout the year. Um, it also helps to do this by thinking about your donors in segments. So all of your donors should receive some kind of stewardship touch point at this time, but breaking down those segments can add an even more personal touch while also saving you some time and some money. So when thinking about, you know, that first segment, it could include your top supporters. So that's your top donors, maybe your most engaged volunteers, the people who really kind of show up for you and create a special holiday stewardship gift for the people who went above and beyond for your cause this year. It could be as simple as, you know, a little treat with a handwritten note. I worked for an organization for a long time um, that was an oncology camp for kids with cancer. And we actually had a volunteer who was a baker. And every year she would put together these really cute little cookies in the shape of a campfire for us. And people went crazy for them. So something small, consumable, and on brand is a really great touch that shouldn't break the bank for you. And then you have, you know, the next segment, which likely includes your mid-range donors, your monthly donors, um, maybe more occasional volunteers, and could be something special and personalized, but on a smaller scale. And it, this is a really good time to think about your holiday card with a handwritten note. So many donors still like to get personal handwritten cards. Um, digital is obviously really important and is becoming more popular with younger donors, but we're at an interesting time in fundraising when we have a vast spread of generations within our donor bases. Um, they all have different expectations, different levels of comfort with digital options, so a handwritten card can really go a long way. Uh, and then finally, you have that last segment, still very important, but this one probably includes more of your one-time donors, your event participants, volunteers, and you can take a more digital approach with this segment. So take that design that you did for the holiday card, don't reinvent the wheel, use it as a digital card that you can send out on a larger scale to more or less everyone remaining in your database after removing those first two segments. The next recommendation I would make is to look at the stewardship opportunities that leverage the channels that you already use. You likely have a few ways that you're talking to your supporters, whether it's through email, uh, on the phone, social media, in person, but just like your campaigns, your stewardship should follow a multi-channel approach. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, that one-to-one -one donor, st donor stewardship, thank you calls, holiday cards, all of those good things. But there are also a lot of opportunities during your end to acknowledge your bigger, biggest supporters on, uh, on an even grander scale. So it's always a good idea to start with a stewardship matrix, um, create different criteria for what every donor will receive depending on how much they gave or how much they have engaged with your organization in other ways, like through volunteering or gifts in kind, all of those good things. Um, and creating a stewardship matrix, is, matrix makes it really easy for your team to execute it. They can basically pick it up, see what criteria each donor falls into and know exactly the action that they need to take. And once you have that all mapped out uh, in terms of the opportunities that make the most sense based on your groups, uh, you can reserve kind of the grander gestures for your bigger supporters to really shout from the rooftops how grateful you are for their support. And I know we're looking at year end specifically today, but when you're deciding who you're going to recognize on a larger, more public scale, it is good to look at the people who have been your biggest supporters throughout the year. 
Um, absolutely, if somebody comes out of the blue and makes a huge donation during year end, definitely recognize them. But in general, this is a good opportunity to show some love to your biggest fans. So this works best through a couple channels. Uh, the first is social media. You can put out a post thanking a certain donor or groups of donors for their support of your organization throughout the year. Um, definitely check with them first if you're planning to post their name or any dollar value of their gift. Sometimes donors do like to keep that information anonymous. Um, but a good way around that can be, you know, sharing a number that is tied to an impact by saying something along the lines of, you know, because of this person's support this year, we were, we were able to accomplish X, Y, Z, whether it be a research advancement, um, the ability to purchase things for your community, improving access to healthcare, or whatever it may be that your mission is, is focused on. Um, those are all really amazing ways to showcase impact without tying a name or a donation amount to it, if your donors are a little bit more extra sensitive to that. Uh, the next channel is email. So you are very likely sending out campaign emails as part of your year-end fundraising. Um, you already have them going out, already have them written, um, and they're probably their goal of them is to encourage more donations to come in before the end of the year. Those emails are a great place to put donor recognition spotlights. So ask for a quote from some of your top supporters about why they support your, your cause. Include that quote, a photo of them, and a, an impact statement in one of those emails. And not only is it a great way to steward your top donors, but it also serves as inspiration for the recipients of the email to give to your campaign. And then the last channel uh, that I'm going to mention is your website. So look for areas on your website to set up a donor recognition wall. You can create, you know, different tiers based on giving amounts. Um, again, it would that would be part of your stewardship matrix. But it's a great place to recognize your donors publicly. Uh, just make sure that one, you tell them about it so that they know it's there and that they're okay with their name being published. And two, that a link to that wall is put in your campaign emails as well to drive people to the page, look at your donors, and maybe even get inspired to be on the wall as well. Next, use videos. Videos are becoming more and more popular. Um, in general, our attention spans are getting shorter <laughs> with the amount of emails we receive, uh, you know, the social scrolling we do, um, videos are a form of content that really catches people's eye and, and makes them stop and listen. So there's a couple ways that you can use videos for your year-end stewardship really effectively without high costs. And the first is through <clears throat> user-generated content. So create a year-end video that uses footage from your community. It's a really great opportunity to steward your supporters by asking them to film a short clip of them doing something, whether it is sharing the connection to your cause, saying why they support you, or, you know, saying what their holiday wish is for the people in your community, whatever it, it may be. But you can take all of those clips and compile them really easily with very basic video software. If you don't even have that resource in-house, there are websites where you can contract that work out for a very, very low cost. And it creates really great content for your social media to not only kind of encourage donations to keep coming in, but show appreciation for your existing donors. The next way that you can use videos is, again, engaging your team. Here we are again. Um, Giving Tuesday and year-end fundraising should be a very complete team effort. But asking your colleagues to film short videos thanking your top supporters during year end is a really great stewardship opportunity. Um, it's amazing if you can get your CEO to do it, but obviously your CEO is probably very busy. So anyone from your leadership team, from your fundraising team, um, even somebody that works on your mission team are such great people that your donors want to hear from. So a video should be short, it can be filmed on a cell phone, it should be, you know, a general thank you message tied to the impact made through year-end giving, and it can include another kind of fundraising push. 
Um, that's kind of, you know, on a grander thank you stewardship opportunity, but these videos also are really effective um, when looking at personalized stewardship and one-to-one -one stewardship. If you can get your CEO or somebody else to record a short video giving a personal thank you to a donor that has made a significant gift using their name and their gift amount um, and sharing the impact of their gift, that goes such a long way. Um, remember again, it's really important to make it easy for them. <clears throat> so write a script, do everything you can to make it as easy as possible. And it really should take them five minutes to do. And it's something that can be sent out in emails really easily and shows a lot of love to your donors. So you made it through the holidays. You're probably feeling a lot like this, <laughs> but just because December has ended doesn't mean your year-end efforts are quite finished yet. About 12% of annual giving comes in on December 29th, 30th, and 31st. So you are probably getting a ton of donors come in while you may be out celebrating. Maybe you're having some champagne on New Year's Eve. Maybe you're eating turkey with your family. Um, whatever the important things are that you are doing during your holidays, your donors are continuing to make gifts. So it's really important to have as many stewardship opportunities automated as possible. That includes your thank you emails, uh, your tax receipts, maybe a welcome email for new donors. Set all of that up so that you don't have to worry about it when you are taking some well-deserved time off. And then when you're back online in January, um, make sure that you're doing those thank you calls to the donors that came in while your office may have been closed and make that touch point with them. Again, it's, it's really important to contribute to their first impression of your organization. And then once you've done that, it's time to look at impact reports. I know depending on when your fiscal is, uh, you may or may not have an annual report ready, um, but creating like a mini impact report for year-end giving is such a great sponsorship opportunity for the donors that gave to you between Giving Tuesday and December 31st. It doesn't have to be huge. It could be a page, um, but it should include things like how much your campaign raised in total, how many donors gave to your campaign, uh, a message of thanks from your CEO, uh, top donor recognition, and then most importantly, the ties back to that impact messaging, which, you know, this is your opportunity to really celebrate it and celebrate the impact that was made. Um, and putting together this, you know, this kind of mini impact report in January, it's such a great time to send something like this for a couple of reasons. Uh, it will have been over a month since Giving Tuesday, where you likely engaged a lot of new donors. You talked to them once, but then, you know, a million things have happened between Giving Tuesday and January. So it's a really great way of popping into their inbox again, thanking them again, and then reminding them that you're still there. Uh, it also gives you a, a touch point with all of the year-end donors, which buys you a little bit of time to think strategically about how to keep them engaged throughout the year. Um, I know the end of the year is such a, a, a busy time that we don't always think forward into the next year. So by sending this out in early January kind of gives you a bit of a breather room. They've gotten a touch point, they remember you, and then you can figure out where they might best fit within your organization. And most importantly, it's all about impact and showing that great impact that was only possible because of their donations. So um, the best part about all of this stewardship stuff is that there's a ton of ways that Kila can kind of work in the background to make all of this so much easier to accomplish. So I'm going to pass it back to Elsie for a minute, and she's going to cover all of the cool things that Kila can do. Absolutely. Thank you, Meredith. Um, that was fantastic. Makes me realize it's sort of like it's tough because now is the time that the donor stewardship of next year happens. You know what I mean? And so it's like you often, it's all this work that we're putting into it, but the return on that investment of time doesn't come until next year. So I think exactly. sometimes it can be really overwhelming. It feels like, you know, if you're doing it and you're starting out for the first time with a don new donor stewardship kind of plan, it can feel disheartening because it's so much work, but hold on tight because next year you'll be absolutely in good stead. Exactly. It's a long game. Fundraising 100%. is a long, 
it's a long game. So um, you're constantly doing things that may pay off a year from now. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so I do have stuff I want to cover in the Keela system. And then I thought maybe we'll just jump into Q&A. Um, and then everyone's probably going to get a lot of time back in their day. Don't tell your boss, uh, go and get a coffee or something. So I think when when it comes to donor stewardship and when it comes to Keela, I think what we're really talking about is interactions. So I made you the host, Meredith, and now I can't share my own screen. <laughs> Oh, I am so sorry. I should be able to reclaim host. Oh, no, I can I can do it myself. Okay, there we go. go. Okay, that is what a day. What a time to be alive. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen and it should say welcome Elsie Coffee. Does that is it beautiful? Okay. So all of this stuff that you're doing is so, so important, as Meredith said. And every one of us thinks, yes, we're on board, we're all going to be doing donor stewardship. But all of that. Um, all of that work that you're going to be doing now for the investment next year, it's not going to be as effective if you don't make a promise to yourself that you're going to track every single one of those touch points. All those different variations need to be tracked in Keela. And the way that we do that is with interactions. So let's kind of talk through some of the examples that Meredith used and we'll take a look at how we might log them in Keeler and then we'll look at a couple of different ways that you can use that information. So let's jump into Wednesday Adams profile. I'm going to hit up her interactions tab. And from here, you can just manually log an interaction. Easy peasy. You just come in and you say, okay, we had a video conference. It was on this date. This was the subject line. And you can even add attachments. So that's really good for tracking things like receipts. If you did happen to buy a big box of donuts and you're going to be claiming that back with the tax man, you can pop the receipt in there and it makes things easy for next year too. Now, I want to look, talk about an extra little option in here that sometimes folks miss, which is the ability to say that there were more contacts involved in this interaction. So this can be really handy if you did a kind of group conference or something like that. So let's say Wednesday Adams was on this call, but actually Uncle Festa, Morticia, Pugsley, Gomez, the whole Adams family was, actually, was there. It was a remarkable video conference. And you can save and you can add that in bulk. So you've got that ability as well. And that can be really good, cool because it starts to help you build the interconnected interactions that you're having with folks and you start to build a pattern. On top of this, you can also add a to-do. And this is really useful if you need any kind of follow-up or any kind of circle back around. Now, I think I'm of the persuasion that you should always add a to-do, even if you don't have a specific action item right now. At the very least, it'll give you space or a reminder to think about this connection in an upcoming month. So let's say, we'll say circle back for another video conference. Oh, I can't spell today. And then you can just pop that due date. Let's say we'll do it in January. So we're gonna circle back with the whole Adams family in January and I'm going to assign it to wonderful Josh. And we'll go ahead and we'll save it. So it's sort of like a way for you. I've missed an important field subject line. Sorry. It was a call to chat about volunteer opportunities, we'll say. So what you're doing is you're sort of leveraging the Keeler system, leveraging your technology to, to take away the mental burden of keeping track of this donor stewardship. As Meredith showed, it's so important to have people and real life interconnection and, and conversations and the real power of donor stewardship comes from the people. But because we can't replace these beautiful, wonderful connections with technology yet, none of us are robots. We're all here with a real heart and a real soul. We need to find ways to ease the, the the pressure in other areas. So to, and things like adding reminders for yourself is where we're going to be doing that. So rely on your technology, leverage your technology so that you get more time and more space to have those beautiful people connections because that's what it's all about, right? So I've just used Keela to log a manual interaction. I logged it on everybody's profile. It was brilliant. I've added it to do. So I know that no matter what, in January, I'm going to get a reminder to say, hey, you had a chat with the Adams family. It was a wonderful experience. Don't ever forget. Um, and also it's maybe consider having another conversation with them or just having another touch point. 
So that's a great way for logging manual interactions, but what happens if you have a massive event gala and you have a bunch of different interactions that you wanna log all at once? Well, my friends, all that donor stewardship is going to be tracked and great news, we can actually import interaction data. This is a recent enhancement that we've made sometime in the couple, last couple of months. Uh, but what you can do is you can import all those fields I was just talking about. So you've got the full name, the email address, all that kind of stuff. And then you can have your interaction types. You can say it was a phone call, it was an event gala. You can pop in interaction date and I should have stretched these columns out before I came in. Interaction subject and interaction description. So you can start tracking this information while you're at an event. Every time you see someone coming in, you see conversations that are happening, you can start typing it into this spreadsheet and you, it'll all be there and visible for you and you'll just be able to import it um, sometime before the end of this year and, and do it all in one go. So start thinking out of the box for how you're going to be tracking these conversations and these donor stewardship. It's really important that you do. I know it sounds like it might be a lot of work, but the payoff really comes, like I said, next year. So once you've got all of this information available, let's say it's all in your account. Let's head to the oh, contacts. Let's head to the interactions tab. And I've got 603 interactions in here. So 603 touch points that I've had with all of my donors spanning my entire uh, history with the Keela system. And I can filter this. So I can filter my interactions or I can even filter my contacts by my interactions. So let's say we're gonna look at phone calls. I'm gonna add an interaction filter. So we've got interaction filters in here. I'm gonna look at the type and I'm gonna say, I wanna look at any contacts who I've had a phone call with. We'll go ahead and we'll review that. So I can see that I've had 17 contacts this year that I've had that phone call with. Now, what gets really, really exciting is what happens if we save this? Let's save that segment. What happens if I start analyzing their donation data? So I'm going to go into a report and let's just create a report of all contacts and their transactions. So we get all these wonderful little graphs in here that are going to express their donations. What happens if I add that filter I was just looking at? Go all interactions, type and phone. So now what I'm doing is I'm cross-referencing the success of, don of these kind of touch points that we've had across donations. So I've had se um, 17 contacts who I've had phone calls with for a total of 512 donations, which is really, really impactful. So this is how you can start keeping track of the effectiveness of your interactions, of your donor stewardship through this way. And I think year after year, you're gonna really hone in on what's successful for you. It's always important to track and to, uh, to make changes and to make adjustments year over year. So that's my piece on why you should be using technology wherever you can. But of course, Meredith has made us realize that it's really important to do the people stuff, the people side of things, and they can go together really nicely. Peas and carrots. I think I'll transition now into question time. We only have three from the looks of things. Uh, and then I think everyone can get some time back in their day. So uh, I'll go through the questions. If I can answer any, I will. But Meredith, I may throw to you if something's very marketing. Okay. Um, but we had the first one. Ashley, do you have an example of a script for calls? So I've got a couple of different things uh, that I'm working with. Uh, I have sort of a, a one that I refer to a lot for when I'm making scripts for webinars and things like that. And I did a quick Google while I was listening to Meredith and I found another one that I think is very cool. But just, just so we get an answer on the call, because um, I'll include those resources in the follow-up email, just so I get an answer here. I think there's a, there's a sort of a three-point basic structure of these calls. The first step is the introduction and the kind of rapport building the second step is presenting the problem, the problem that you and your organization are trying to solve. And the third step is the ask. And I think that there's a way to really find, to make it as punchy as possible, as short as possible, and to, for it to be more powerful. So having those three stages, the introduction, the problem, and then the ask, having those guides the conversation, it stops it from getting out of hand, but it also has more power, I find, the more the more um, 
direct and oh, I can't think of the word, the uh, less, not as verbose, the more uh, it's not so wordy. Meredith, oh, I'm mind blanking. What is this word? Like specific? Specific, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. Specific, <laughs> yes. The, I find that with these kind of conversations, the more words that you use, the less power the conversation can have. So that would be my recommendation as well. But the, the three point thing. Do you have anything to add to that, Meredith? Yeah, I was just going to say in terms of stewardship phone calls and, and scripts for those, if you have your team helping you make those, which again, I would really recommend, um, you know, it's a, it's a lot of, it's a big undertaking. So it should always open with the thank you. Um, that's how you should be kicking that off. You know, an introduction of, hey, it's Meredith from Kila. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your gift of X amount. Um, I would recommend having some like quick, pre-drafted impact statements of what you're going to be accomplishing over the next little while and what that money is going towards. And then I would lead into just the simple question of like, if they're a new donor, how did you hear about us? Um, and that is really where you're going to get those like golden nuggets of information in terms of if these people could be lifelong supporters or not. Um, and then always end it with a thank you again. Um, that kind of like sandwiched thank you is how you get the information that you need while showing them some love. Um, your emails are really, and like those, the calls that Elsie referenced are where you can make more of those asks. Um, there should be, I know we always try to like, sometimes we want to throw in a sneaky ask in like a stewardship, uh, a stewardship effort. It's not always wrong, but it's always like choosing your audience. So if they're a new donor, I would recommend going with the thank you, just plain and simple and trying to understand why they, um, why they gave to you. 100%. And no matter what you do, track, 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 keep track yeah. of the success, keep track of the, you know, the one line that you have for your ask, have five different versions of it and try it out. And if you mm -hmm. see success in one, then stick with that. I yeah. find um, that's, yeah, making sure like kind of A-B testing, right? A hundred percent. And that, you know, that question just gave me inspiration in terms of like our new marketing tool that we could put yes. out for you guys on Kila. We can Absolutely. write some scripts for you and um, put those up on our, on our website so that you can download them and, and use them as you like. That would be awesome. I don't suppose you'd have that written within the next 24 hours. That seems like an alarming thing. The so um, as soon as they're available, I'll share them. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question is from Allison. How many links are too many in an appeal? I like, Alison likes the idea of linking to a donor wall, but will multiple links be distracting or confuse the donor? Because we do get conflicting. There's sort of like very conflicting camps on this. We all know we need to have a call to action, but we also know that the email shouldn't be too long. We shouldn't have multiple conflicting links. What's your thoughts on that, Meredith? So my thoughts are you can have multiple links. Your call to action, the biggest call to action should be the most prominent and the first link they see. So if, you know, if this example in a, a campaign email, obviously your ask is going to be first. You're going to share some stories. You're going to have, you know, a button or whatever it might be that mm -hmm. says give to us. Um, and then I think further down was a good spot for you to include maybe that quote from a donor that we talked about in terms of why they gave, what they have seen the organization accomplish. And then it could be as simple as a line of like, want to see what other donor donors are supporting our organization and then a link to. So I would say cap it at two and have the one that you want the most prominently displayed near the top and a big button and the other ones can be secondary. Love that. Because that is still the goal of your campaign emails is to raise money. So you don't want to distract from that. I totally agree. So keep it simple, make that one front and center, and then add in a secondary one later. 100%. I always find the donor wall and things like that, any kind of leaderboard or anything that's kind of evoking a sense of competitiveness with me mm -hmm. as a donor, I find those to be very, very successful on social media. I think that's yeah. the place where I want to feel like a star and I want to share that I'm a donor and I'm a star. So if you're ever sort of um, conflicted, that's my my approach is that anything that kind of makes me want to, want to be a part of something, especially a donor wall, that would really hit me um, in the heart if it was on social media. Could be another yeah. option too. Yes, for sure. And they they always work really well too for peer to peer. And yes. whether it's like a challenge based, um, anything like that. I know we're talking about your end, but donor walls can be absolutely in so many ways. Yeah. 
they're such a psychology. I'm realizing, I think, I, how susceptible I am to kind of like <laughs> competitiveness. I think it's because I. Oh my gosh. I used to work in peer to peer fundraising for a long time. And I've never seen a donor wall or like a, a fundraiser wall work as well as for a cycling event. That is, I don't know oh if anybody on the call is a cyclist, <laughs> but cyclists are a different breed of human. They're the most competitive people I've ever Absolutely. met. Absolutely. But I could become a cyclist. Like if you gave, if I saw that someone was succeeding at it, it would make me all of a sudden, I'm Lance Armstrong right now. It's bizarre. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) I love that. Another one from Alison. Great questions, by the way. These are real kind of, I feel like we're on a talk show right now or something like that. They're really good questions for that. Another one from Alison. Does the import have to have the same content across all fields? No, you can have anything you want in it. Um, So it's really good for, I I find sometimes as much as I want everyone to move away from spreadsheets, I find sometimes it's really easy to pop a quick note in the uh, spreadsheet and then import it into Keela later. So it can be really good if you're just jotting down little bits and pieces throughout the day. You know, you could just have the um, the type. You can set it up so that you can click and drag and these can all be different. It can be all the same, but then you can have your little notes in here. So we talked about volunteering and then maybe down here we had a chat about cycling. And it can all be it can all be different. So that's how I kind of envision this tool working: is you use the Excel spreadsheet as a place to keep your notes, or a Word document, or something like that, as you're going along. And then you can copy and paste it into here, or keep it in here, and then import it. So, yeah, no, it can be all different. It does need to fit into our Keeler parameters, though. And we've got uh, an article on formatting. Let me have a look down here. Formatting interactions. There we go. So it has all the accepted fields that you can have. So as long as it's within these parameters, you're good to go. Okay. Three questions there. Any questions in the chat? Ah, oh, I just want to read this amazing feedback out, Meredith. We've got thank you. Yes, thank you. Amazing. So useful. Thank you. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Thank you so much for coming. This has been a really, really fun one. And it's nice sometimes just to have, I think, to have a little break from learning really, really, really high level concepts and just chat. And I really appreciate you showing up today and and bringing that chat and bringing that delightfulness. So thank you so much. Hope to have you back on the show again. Everyone else, um, have an amazing day. Good luck next week. If you need anything, we'll be here. Uh, The killer team are always here to help, especially at Giving Tuesday. It's a big time of the year. Everyone have a wonderful uh, 14 minutes left of your day for free. (laughs) Bye for now. Bye, thank you.